Hi, we're going to be talking about exploitative interactions. I'm Sue Glenn, and this is for my ecology class. We're using a textbook that was written by Manuel Moles and Anna Sharon. Our examples are mainly out of that book. It's called Ecology Concepts and Application. It was published in 2019 by McGraw-Hill because it's the eighth edition. And we've already talked about uh, competition between different species. Uh, and now we're going to be talking about other types of exploitative interactions, which is predation, herbivory, so things eating each other, parasites, parasitism, and diseases. So this is uh, the first section of uh, chapter 14 in that textbook. So if you remember when we talked about competition, it was uh, interaction between two species, or actually when two species are competing for a resource, both species are in some way harmed. Their fitness is reduced in uh, competing for that resource. Uh, exploitation is an interaction where the fitness of one uh, population or one individual is reduced while um, another one is increased, is enhanced. So one is benefiting and the other one is being harmed. So we have things like predators, we've got parasites that live on a host tissue and reduce its fitness, but they, parasites, your parasites don't generally kill you. Um, but parasitoids, that's an insect larva, so the insect um, lays its egg in the host and then as the larva develops it, it consumes and, and kills the host. And then pathogens, which you know obviously are, are diseases. We'd looked at this table before. Um, this is the table with uh, looking at these different types of species interactions. And we have already dealt with competition where the, the two species are being negatively impacted. Um, we didn't talk about mutualism where they're both benefiting, but that would be something like pollination where you have uh, the insect is getting the reward and the plant is getting the reproductive help. Um, Predation and parasites, one species benefiting, the other one is uh, being negatively affected. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. Um, and then we've got uh, other times where the one species is being benefited and the other one uh, doesn't care, <laughs> doesn't know it's there. One where it's being harmed and the other one, I don't know, I was doing anything wrong. And then neutralism where uh, nobody's impacting each other. So the nice thing about this textbook is that it goes into detail on specific experiments on how we know things. And uh, this is an experiment that was uh, done on uh, these insects, these insect larvae, uh, caddisfly larvae, living down in the bottoms of streams. And these larvae make these beautiful little homes uh, where they collect up the stones and they basically are gluing them together um, to make a, a nice little shell out of the stones. And the ones in this particular example, this was a study done by uh, Gary Lamberti and uh, Vincent Resch. And they were looking at the caddisfly helia Helicopsyche borealis, and it makes this really nice um, helical uh, little home that it carries carries around. You can tell different types of caddisflies by looking at their homes, and uh, and so there's some that make nice little tubes, and these guys make these nice little curvy shells. Uh, they're herbivores. Uh, they're going around eating algae. They'll also eat bacteria, uh, so they're just grazing off the surface of the rocks or along the bottom of the, the streams where they've got the nice freshly flowing water. You're sort of in that rocky riffle area, and you can find these guys going around and uh, cleaning everything everything off nicely for you. Uh, so there's so many of these guys. They they found that uh, they, they would get so many uh, growing, uh, living in the summer and fall that you could get over 4,000 individuals per square meter in this big sulfur creek they were looking at in California. Um, and that's like a quarter of all things living in the bottom of these streams. And so they were thinking, well, they must run out of food, right? They must be competing for, for food and uh, they could possibly reduce their food supply by overeating things. Before we uh, get into uh, the actual experiment, what I, I just wanna show you this really cool little video. It's a different species, um, but uh, it is showing them building their little houses.
Alors les trichoptères sont des insectes qui sont présents dans la plupart des, des rivières de la planète. C'est un insecte donc très, très, très fréquent et qui a la, particuli la particularité de fabriquer un tube de protection avec des matériaux qu'il qu emprunte dans son milieu. Donc en général des cailloux, des petits morceaux de bois, des, des feuilles et parfois même des coquilles d'escargot. En me disant « je connais cet animal qui fabrique un, un tube artificiel avec des matériaux qu'il trouve autour de lui » Et j'ai appris grâce à ses amis que l'or était présent dans la rivière. Donc je me suis dit, pourquoi pas Est-ce que l'animal à la nature aurait le choix Est-ce qu'il pourrait prendre de l'or En tout cas, moi j'ai décidé dans, le, dans une structure artificielle, dans une sorte de laboratoire, de lui donner cet or. Et l'animal n'a pas eu d'autre choix que de confectionner son étui avec l'or, puisque je l'ai privé de tous les autres matériaux. Le travail avec les tricoptères est un travail de collaboration entre moi et les tricoptères. Et disons que je crée des conditions favorables pour que les talents du tricoptère euh, puissent, euh, puissent éclore. Je crée des situations et je suis un peu comparable à l'architecte qui fait travailler les maçons. Comment les idées me viennent le, le problème, c'est que je ne sais pas comment elles viennent. So here's the experiment they set up. They bought these tiles that were unglazed ceramic tiles. And uh, they're about like, um, just to give you the scale, this is, they're, they're about uh, 15 centimeters by eight centimeters across. And uh, they put them down the bottom of the creek and then looked at what was growing on them because um, they got the algae growing on them over the course of their experiment. So we can see when they put them down, they were nice and clear. And here you can see the seven weeks later at the end of the experiment. Um, so they were clear to start with and seven weeks later, they have the, the algae growing all over them. Um, and they, f they found that uh, uh, They put, they've got basically three experimental setups here. One is putting the tiles down on the bottom of the creek. Back here, they put natural stones so they could just make sure the tiles weren't like too artificial and too different. And then, so this is the tiles, this is stones. And then up here in the front, These are raised tiles. So these guys are actually sitting a little bit above the surface. And, uh, and the caddisflies, because of their little shells, can't get up onto that last, this last one. So this is, this is another control, is um, without the caddisfly larvae. And they have this little ingenious pathway uh, so that if they, The, the only way could, could get there to lay their eggs on it was to go over this little hooked um, piece of metal that went out of the uh, up of the water, and uh, they couldn't do it. So, um, so they could look at how many algae and how many uh, caddisflies you had in each one of these situations. So, within the first couple of weeks, we have the the algae algae are shown in red and so we have the algae in the first two weeks is peaking in this period so you have lots and lots of algae with the bacteria all mixed in and these are the tiles that are on the on the uh, bed of the stream and in that time we can see the number of uh, caddis flies is uh, starting to grow and as they eat all of this algae as you get more and more caddis flies they're starting to deplete the food source so the amount of algae will start to drop down so by the time we get to the third week you've got uh, quite a reduction in algae and that means the caddis flies are going to start running out of food and so their population will decline There's still lots of them and they are eating. So as they are continuing to eat, the algae just starts to drop off. Now, once the caddis flies get down to a lower population size, then the algae can start recovering. But your algae, your caddis fly population kind of lags. So um, they, they, this, there's not enough algae here to support this big population. So the, um, 
uh, caddisfly population drops again. The way this graph is set up, I should have shown you, the, the weeks of the study are here. On the left axis is your algae, and on the right axis is your caddisfly population. So back to what the experiment looks like then, we can see that the tiles um, sitting on the floor of the stream with the uh, caddisflies able to crawl all over them have no algae, and the rocks also no algae. But these tiles where they had eliminated the caddisflies, they couldn't get there, um, we can see that clearly they had a huge impact on the algae population um, and uh, without the without the caddis flies um, you'd have uh, a lot of algae and bacteria uh, growing on the surface of those rocks so uh, you can see that exploitation is a really important um, process in this ecosystem and uh, and one way of studying that is when you take away the herbivore take away the predator what happens to the things that they were eating. You can see the size of that impact. So this is just uh, showing you the uh, size of that impact by looking at uh, the weeks of the experiment. And we're looking at the number of um, caddis flies. Uh, and you can see that they had successfully reduced the number of caddis flies on the elevated tiles. And uh, whereas there were lots and lots of caddis flies that were on the ones that were on the stream bed. And then uh, we look at all the other vertebrates and they did manage to show that it didn't matter whether they elevated the tiles or not. Um, you still have lots and lots of other things there. So they were only taking away the one thing. This is looking at the bacteria and the algae. So this is the food instead of the caddis flies. And so once again, across the x-axis, we have the weeks of the experiment. Uh, and then we have on the y-axis on the top graph, we have the number of bacteria. And so removing the caddis flies uh, from, uh, from the tiles so that you didn't have, you had the elevated tiles, you can see you had a lot more bacteria. And then down here, we have the algae. And when you remove the caddis flies, you have a lot more algae as well. This example was a study done um, in Sweden. And we're looking at a, a predator, the red fox. We're looking at uh, its prey, which are uh, hares mountain hares, and we're also looking at a, a parasite, which is mange. And when we look at this map on the left, we can see the cases of mange and red foxes uh, moving up into, uh, moving into northern Sweden. So they moved up into that area, and then they had spread from there uh, across most of the most of the country. And uh, this was a uh, study by uh, Lindstrom and his uh, colleagues. And the uh, mange is a, is a mite. And uh, so they were looking at the spread of these, these mites, which was uh, causing a reduction in the population of red foxes. And the red fox uh, population across Sweden uh, dropped by over 70% uh, as this, that's a down arrow, dropped by over 70% uh, as this mange spread. So uh, they were interested to see how the prey would respond. Uh, so from uh, 1972 to 1933, they looked at several prey species as well as the red fox species, so they could uh, see how the uh, reduction of the fox was uh, impacting the prey. So here's a little picture of the mountain hare. They have a uh, they have white fur in the winter and they have brown fur in the summer. Um, I just love the 
expression on this guy's face. Uh, so the results of the study were really clear. The red foxes in Sweden really reduced their prey. So in this diagram, we can see on the left, across the bottom, we've got the year of the study uh, from going from the uh, 1965 to, to 1990. On the, the left scale, we have the number of foxes, and the foxes are shown with the solid red line. And then on the uh, right side, we have the number of hairs, and the number of hairs are um, shown with the dotted line. So the, the hairs are on the, the right scale, the foxes are on the left scale. And then the line down the middle is showing you uh, uh, the prior the years prior to having the ma the mange on the left side, and to the right side are the years after the mange appeared in Sweden. And so initially, before the outbreak of mange, the numbers of hares were fluctuating uh, somewhere around thirty thousand to sixty thousand hares. And uh, the population of foxes, we can see, was very high at that period. We also can see some, some ups and downs. So when the uh, fox population uh, got big, it caused a collapse in the hare population. And as the hare population declined, then the foxes couldn't support those populations. When the fox population got low, the hare population started to climb again. So more foxes survived, and then that caused the crash. So you see these oscillations. And we're going to be talking about these oscillations in the next part of the chapter when we talk about predator-prey dynamics. Um, but we can see here when the, the mange hit, the fox population crashed. And when it crashed, the mange population, um, or so the, the hare population, just dramatically increased. Uh, there's just a huge number of hares at this point. Um, and then we can imagine uh, at this number of hares, we start to have uh, the uh, logistic growth issues of density dependent factors coming into play, like competition for food. Uh, and then we can see that the, the uh, Fox population starts to climb a little bit, but the, pair, the hare population is dramatically uh, reducing there. But really what we are looking at in this particular diagram is that this reduction in the fox population is leading to a very, very rapid rise in the hare population. Before we move on to the next section of the chapter, I just wanted to um, emphasize uh, how much detail they gave us on that study about the um, caddis flies and its algae food supply, and uh, and that the uh, went over how the researchers actually like went from the first experiment to the second experiment, um, so that they they could do that experiment where they raised the tiles and made sure that everything didn't go onto those tiles, and uh, and and think about why they had to do that and uh, why they couldn't just control uh, draw conclusions just from looking at the tiles that were flat on the surface um, because these experimental designs are really trying to control for a number of variables and also when you say uh, you have removed something notice they showed you the data that they had removed um, the caddis flies from those raised tiles so pay attention to those uh, those details on those um, those experiments. So our uh, next chapter, we're going to be our next section of the chapter. We're going to be talking about predator-prey dynamics, and we're going to talk about uh, um, uh, some more Lotka Volterra models. Uh, but instead of competition, this time we're going to be dealing with their uh, predator-prey model. See you there.